So wow, well, thank you very much for that nice introduction. Uh, you know, prior to the conference, they asked us a little bit of uh, questions, so we had to answer personal questions about our personal food and stuff. I thought they would do a joke, basically, but that was the introduction. So, <laughs> very thanks uh, for that introduction. Yeah, however, um, welcome to my talk. Um, welcome to Andrew Romcom's all, uh, conf, also from my side. I'm very, very glad to be here. I'm very, very glad that you are here. And uh, I would like to talk about architecting Angular apps with uh, libraries. But before we start, I would like to introduce myself. So uh, you already heard, hi, I'm Fabian. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I'm Google developer expert and uh, Pluralsight author. And I'm a web developer ever since. So I'm, I'm doing ASP.NET Core on the back end and Angular in the front end uh, since AngularJS. And I did the whole journey with all the uh, highs and lows when it comes to Angular. So in the next, well, roughly 20 minutes, I would like to talk about architecting Angular apps with Angular libraries. And uh, before we start digging into what we can do with libraries and which command we can type and how we can deploy them to NPM and how we can architecture applications for that, I would like to start with a question why should we should do Angular libraries? Why should, you, why should you do that inside your application, or why should you add that value uh, to your application? So um, first of all, when we want to answer that question, you have to understand the problem of growing Angular applications, right? So when you start your Angular application, you basically start with a component like this, right? We've all seen that. It's a normal component. We've got a template. We've got a name and a data binding and stuff. And all works pretty well. And technically, we could do a whole Angular application in one component. But we do not want to do that, right? So what we are doing is we are building multiple components inside our application. Our application grows and we're doing the first component, and then the second component, and then we're adding another one, and I don't know how many we will add, but the application grows, and it grows, and it grows. All right? And suddenly you come to a point where you will organize your application in like modules. Right? So you have several components. Maybe you added the service on that, and you have that like in one component. And suddenly you add uh, in one module, and suddenly you add another module, which also holds a component, and maybe that component needs exactly the value or the, the values from the service you have placed in the first module, right? So what we could do now, technically, depending on the syntax you're using, you could inject the services in the component easily. It would totally work. Um, but what we, are, what we want to do is we would add another module to that. And we would just extract the service to that module or folder, depending on the, uh, on the syntax you're using. And then we are distributing that service, which we just extracted into the uh, other module. We would just distribute it from there. Right? So this is, this is kind of um, the, the architecture we have like in one application. That works pretty well. We are ju just trying to get the lowest common denominator. And then we are basically building our application up. Right, so this works pretty well for one application. But now you're sitting in your office and you, or maybe your coworker comes towards you and say, hey, do you know you just built that nice logging library or that nice logging service? Uh, I, would like to, I would like to add that in my application too, right? So when it comes to the borders of applications, sharing code gets a problem. So what we do is we're adding another app which also needs that service. That's the app from your coworker. And he said, hey, I need the same service or the same component or the same pipe or whatever you like inside of my application. How can we solve that problem? How can you give me um, what you did in your application, what you implemented once, and I want to consume it as well? You know? And exactly here is where libraries come into play. So what we can do is we can add a library uh, outside our applications. And this is not only app one, app two. This could be like as many uh, applications as you want. So we're building a library outside your applications. And we're just moving the service or the components or the modules in there. And then we're just providing the functionality over the applications. And we're just moving it out into the library so that we can share code over the borders of applications. Right? And this is a pretty cool thing. And this adds pretty much value inside your application when your application grows. So to answer the question why we should do Angular libraries, um, the first thing which comes into our mind is now reusability. So you can reuse code. You write them once, and you can reuse it like you did it with components with a selector, what we have seen. Right? You're just writing a component, and you can place it anywhere you want to inside your application. However, we can do the same now with not only components, also module services. And we're just extracting it out, and we can reuse it as many uh, times as we want to. 
Another reason is, of course, testing. We have just seen it in the keynote, right? So testing is a big part in Angular, and we can really, really test our application pretty well because we just got uh, the code we, we want to test out of application, like in a single container, and there we can uh, just work with it and test only the logging functionality, and then we know that logging functionality basically works if we test it well, and uh, the, bu the bug is not lying inside the application. It must be inside a wrap, right? Another thing is complexity. What you, what you, depending on your app, you're reducing the complexity of your application. You basically, the code gets smaller because you extracted something out and your app is not that complex as it has been before. Um, of course, if you, t if you get a step back and you look at the whole picture of what libraries you're using, you're adding like another bubble because you're adding one library which you're using. So there is another point. Um, but also you reduce the complexity inside your application, right? Because you got rid of the code and you just extracted it. All right, now that we know why we should do Angular libraries and what advantages it has, let us um, take a look at the requirements of uh, an Angular library. And I would refer to a blog post Minko Gatechev wrote. Uh, the link is down here. You can get the slides on Twitter after that talk, basically. Um, and this blog post dates back to 2017, but it's pretty accurate still. However, he says, an Angular library should be platform independent, right? So what does that mean? When we're inside an Angular library, Angular is a platform, so we don't know if we have the DOM which renders our application. We just don't know it, right? So platform independent means that you should not consume like the document or the window element directly, right? We have classes in Angular which abstract that for us, the renderer two stuff, and um, yeah, this makes your library basically platform independent if you're not referred directly to any dumb things like window or document or something like that. So keep it simple there and just um, not refer to any specific platform because then the library would only work on that platform, basically. It should be bundled, right? Nobody wants to see all the 2,000 files you have got inside your library. What we want to do is we want to bundle our application or our library to the smallest files as possible and then, then just ship them. It should be very, very easy to get the, as a consumer, to get the library inside my application and just use it, right? I don't want to handle 1,000 files. I just want to handle, like, in the best case, one file, and then I want to use the functionality you provide with your library. It should be AOT compatible, of course. It should be AOT compiled. We do not want to ship the AOT compiler with our library, and we do not want that the consumer needs the Angular, the AOT compiler, to compile a library for us. You know, it should be ready to use. It should be AOT um, ready and then got shipped so that the consumer can just use it. And of course. We want to use TypeScript for it, because we know the types uh, in JavaScript are basically missing, so we really love adding the values of types, and refactoring gets easier, and we can track down bugs very, very easily. And with all that in mind, you know, we know now what value adds uh, libraries for us. We know the requirements of a library. The Angular team sat down and said, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we could do like a, like a standardized format how our Angular library should be built? And they came up with the Angular package format. The Angular package format is nothing else than a recommended way to distribute Angular packages. It's just a file in the metadata structure, and it should support various formats. So your library should support various formats. It's also the format of the Angular core packages. So every Angular package you pull in from the Angular team, it's made by the Angular package format. The Angular package format is basically, it's like just a contract. It's in uh, Google Doc where you can read in. Uh, you have to just Google it, and now we're currently at version 8. Um, and yeah, basically, it's all what I'm telling here is uh, standing there. There's also a talk from um, the speaker after me is referenced there. So basically, you want to take a look at that one. OK, so now we know the Angular package format. So there is a standardized format for it. What are the steps to produce an Angular library? Or what's, what's going on behind uh, under the hood when we are building an Angular library? Well, first, we have to inline the templates which makes it easier for us to render the whole component or to compile the whole component, right? 
So the next step building an Angular library would be the Angular compiler. NGC is the Angular compiler. It's the pure compiler. It should run over our Angular library and then just spit out the various formats the Angular package format says we should spit out, basically. And this is ESM 2015, which is basically just ECMAScript 6. Then we have ESM 5, which stands for ECMAScript Module 5, which is kind of a hybrid format. So on the one hand, we have like ECMAScript 5, like the good old days, so the younger guys don't know that anymore, but uh, the older ones do. So we have ECMAScript 5, but we are adding the import and export statements from ECMAScript 6 to it. So this is the only ECMAScript 6 feature we're adding to that, and the outcome is the ECMAScript Module 5. And then we have UMD. UMD stands for Universal Module Definition, and it's nothing else than a uh, summary of uh, the asynchronous module definition in ECMAScript 5 and the common JS from ECMAScript 5. This is how we have done module th uh, systems back in the days, right? So now, if you, if you cover that, you have like every, um, every format included, and you can distribute every, uh, for every case. But you don't have to do that by yourself. There are packages out there, which is called the ng Packager. Right? The Angular Packager is now included in the Angular CLI. We'll take a look at that next. But basically, the Angular Packager is running under the hood. So the Angular Packager does all that for you. And what comes out if you have run your code through the Angular Packager is basically this. So you see the bundles folder on top, which is like uh, the UMD format. We have ESM5. We have ESM 2015. Then there are the flat versions, so flat ECMAScript 5 and flat ECMAScript 2015, which is basically the same format, but just in one file. All right. Then we have the library, which is basically our code. We have the metadata JSON, the package, and the readme JSON. The metadata is for the AOT um, thing. So we have the d.ts files, which are um, the definition files for TypeScript that the consumer of our library has that nice IntelliSense and just can type like dot, and then he gets the suggestions what to do with our services and stuff. I want to pay uh, a little bit of attention to the uh, public API TS file, because the public API file is kind of like the entry point for your application. So everything you want to consume from the outside of your, of your Angular library or everything from the, from the standing of the Angular library, which you want to get out, which you have make public uh, from that uh, library, it should be run over the public API file. It's kind of like an abstraction level where you phone to from the consumer, and then it redirects everything. So we can, um, we can configure it as an entry file, which is public-api.ts, and that API has just exports in it. It's like a kind of, like I said, an abstraction where we just say, OK, I want, to, uh, I want to export this and that and this and that. And basically, what you export is logically visible from the outside. What you do not export is staying private. And so you can handle like this private it and this public things. What that gives you is, as another advantage beside the abstraction, is that you have nice and clean imports from the consumer side. So now we're just importing, in this case, my first module from mylib. And we will not import from mylib slash source slash lib and stuff like that. So, so we would never do that, although Visual Studio Code tries to fool you sometimes. right? So uh, basically, we're just importing from the name of a library, which is mylib, which then refers to the public API, which then refers to your files, basically. Of course, you can also add uh, multiple services, modules, and whatever you like. I would like to uh, take a look at some code right now. I'm just getting out of my presentation here. So what we do have here is we have a like, normal Angular application. I will try to open up like I have it here. Can you see that? Is it good? OK, perfect. So we have just, I just erased like the template, and uh, I've just um, added hello from Angular component in the app component.html. So that whole thing runs. We will start. So if I press F5 here, you can see hello from the Angular component. Now, when you're building your Angular CLI project, and this is what I kind of basically really, really like, you can just open up a console, and you just can type ng generate library. And then you type the name, which, uh, name of your library, which could be my-lib. I did that already because of the lack of time. However, if I would press Enter right now, what uh, Visual Studio Code does is, or what the Angular CLI does is, it adds like this project folder we see on the left-hand side here. And here you can see that a folder is being created for your my-lib, and then we have a source folder, and here we have that public API file, so it gets created for you. And that also means that if you are developing an Angular CLI application and you got the thought that maybe this would be a nice candidate for a library, you just can extract it 
right? It, it, you can just go on. You can build it in parallel, right? So now that library got created for us. We can see all the code from that library is basically in here. It's a normal component, like a module in the service system, like you know it from any other Angular application. So what it also does is that ng-generate library, it goes to a tsconfig file, and it adds this paths array here, what we can see right here. And this basically means to your application, Dear application, if you see an import which matches this string here, do redirect it to this folder. If it does not match, please look into the node modules. Right? So now we're just like catching that import and redirecting it to the dist folder. And the dist folder can be created if you just do ng build my lib and press enter, and then the whole ng packager will run, and then it will go. Um, and create your application or your library. So in the dist folder, we have that mylib here, and you can see that like that is the whole Angular package format. And I will try to import the mylib module here now, mylib module. There you go, and it imports it correctly from mylib. And now I just can, inside my app component, I just can refer to lib my lib. Well, you can, of course, um, do the prefixes as you want to. This is the component which lives inside my Angular library. And if I'm now heading back to the browser, you can see that my lib works. So this one is coming from that library which lives beside my Angular CLI project, and this one is coming from my uh, Angular CLI application, which I basically currently um, code. All right. So let me. Jump back to my presentation. All right, we have seen the code. If you do an ng build, you can see um, that all the formats are getting spit out, right? And this is the Angular package format uh, being created. This is what you see on the console if you do it on Windows. However, you can also add a watcher on it, right? You can also say, uh, rebuild the Angular library when I change some code and it gets rebuilt, and then you can use it on the fly. So you can really build it in parallel, which I think is a really, really good thing. Of course, you can also test your library, which is absolutely no problem. You can do ng tests and then mylib, and it will run only the test for your library. Everything is included in the Angular CLI. If you want to use the CLI, uh, the, the library locally, first of all, um, we have to rely on the NPM CLI here. We all know the NPM CLI. And what you can do is, you can, from the consumer perspective, just NPM install to a folder. Right? So you can npm install mylib dist, and then it will install um, the Angular package format, with li which lives in the distribution folder right there. What you can also do, I wouldn't recommend that, to be honest. Sometimes it's a bit shaky. Right? So what you can do is you can cd into the dist folder and just run npm pack. And then it will be generate a tarball file for you. It gets created. And this tarball file can then be installed. Right? So you can back in your consumer, do npm install, blah, 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 and then your package.tgz file. Um, the best would be like uh, having a local NPM server like Vedachi or something, and uh, this would be probably like the best experience. If you want to deploy the library, you should um, pay attention to several properties. One of them is the version. Right? This is the package.json inside the library, and the version follows uh, the semantic versioning principle, so you all know that. We have major, minor, and patch. Minor and patch are not breaking backwards compatibility. Major does break uh, backwards compatibility, and you can also run that with the NPM CLI, um, just bump the versions. This is totally no problem. Also pay attention to the name. Most likely your name will be gone if you don't have any specific idea. But what you always have if you have an NPM account is that at and then your username. This is your specific scope. Nobody can take that away from you, right? So what you normally do is you do an at, in my case, Fabian Gosebrink, and then the name of the library. And then it's basically pretty good. Nobody can take that name away from you. And you can just publish the NPM. If you want to publish the NPM, the only thing you have to do is in the console, log into NPM, Add a readme file, which is already being done by the Angular CLI. You have the version and the name. Pay attention to that. And then just hit npm publish on the console, and that's it. Then it's uploaded to npm. Right? It's literally that easy. But before you do that, please pay attention to the next slide. And if you have one takeaway from my talk right now, let it be the next slide. Be sure to remove all sensitive information before publishing. 
all the passwords, all the pictures nobody wants to see, right? All your credit card information should be out of the library. Don't publish it, right? So if you want to know more about Angular libraries, there's a nice Pluralsight course written by a pretty cool guy. Uh, I hope you enjoy it, or I hope you uh, take a sneak into it. However, I would like to thank you very much for having me on NG Rome. I wish you a pleasant conference, and uh, I'm here for questions. Thank you.